Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the marketplace. Coming up, Ghana is set to sign debt restructuring agreement with bilateral creditors this week. A move expected to aid the release of $360 million from the IMF next month. Meanwhile, economist Professor Goffred Bokping is warning that any delay in signing this deal with bilateral creditors will affect the city's fortunes going forward. The is reading a deeper meaning into that, and that is why you see the negative sentiment has gone up. And the understanding in the market is that um, a negative news actually exert greater volatility in the market. Also coming up, interest rates tumble once again, but marginally as demand for treasury bills eases. My name is Daryl Kwao. Thanks for being with us. Details coming up. Well, first up, Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam has revealed government is set to sign an agreement on debt restructuring with external creditors this week. The Finance Minister disclosed this in an interview with the Ghana News Agency. There's more in the following report. The Finance Minister has maintained that they are waiting for this draft agreement to sign this week. The Minister added that this should pave the way for the IMF board to meet on Ghana next month and give its approval to the disbursement of this $360 million to the country. The fund had earlier maintained that just having the financing assurance from the bilateral creditors could be enough. However, based on these developments, the IMF may now have all that is looking for to go ahead and approve Ghana's second review and instruct the IMF to release some $360 million to Ghana. For some analysts, it's not just about the money being released to Ghana, but rather the signal that it will send to Ghana's development partners about government's commitment to the fund program. The news may also go a long way to deal with the speculation that has gone a long way to bring some pressure on the Ghana city. We should also not forget about the impact of this development on projects that have stalled over the years and now this could lead to the release of funding to aid in the resumption of these projects all over the country. Well, meanwhile, economist Professor Goffer Bokping is warning that any delay in signing this deal with bilateral creditors will affect the city's fortunes going forward. Part of that is also the delay with the restructuring of our external debt. By now, we we're hoping that Ghana would have passed the second review which would have occasioned the release of the third tranche under the IMF supported program. But because the, the country has not been able to secure the MOU, which is a condition precedent to IMF board approving the second review, there's that delay. And then again, the, the uncertainty with the external debt restructuring. So that vacuum, the market is reading a deeper meaning into that. And that is why you see the negative sentiment has gone up. And the understanding in the market is that um, and negative news actually exert greater volatility in the market compared to positive news of the same magnitude. Something somewhere April, the Ministry of Finance attempted to preempt this by coming out and telling the market that they had reached a give agreement with our external bilateral creditors. That was supposed to calm the market. Once you, you, you reach that, then it shouldn't take us that long for the IMF board to approve the second tranche, out of which we may get $360 million. Mm. Usually, if that had happened and we had had a board approval, that positive news would have probably engineered some confidence in the economy. Okay, now we are missing out on that. 
The other bit we also need to bear in mind, Samson, is that it's an election year. Uh, usually, election year comes with its own uncertainties, right? Mm. Okay, so we have all this happening together with an election year that promises to be a, a competitive one. When it happens that way, in terms of portfolio flows into the country, there's a slowdown, right? So foreign investors would usually adopt the attitude of wait and see, right? Less yeah. the election before they commit to any major investment or portfolio flows. Now, Managing Director of First Bank Ghana, Victoria Asante, is projecting some relative stability for the city in the coming days. This is based on some measures that the Bank of Ghana has taken over the past few days, including improved market support. Ms. Asante tells Joy Business, those that are betting on the situation could lose out. And I think Central Bank has done a lot of interventions this week. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people will know that they, they don't need to uh, bring forward payments that ought to be made and therefore that would then calm people down but yes as soon as and that is why we should never allow it to slip as soon as we have that slip it uh, becomes everybody now starts rushing for the door and that is mm -hmm. a problem yeah, and, and for you you believe that these, these are these are blips and things are going to normalize very soon yeah i think so uh, but it depends on the supply situation mm -hmm. because you see um people are rational it, it, people are everybody's taking decisions based on what, what the marketplace is telling them. If I woke up last, day, uh, last week and it's 14 and it's now 15, I'm going to make a decision which says, get my dollars as quickly as, as I can because I've already hedge priced. Against inflation yes, or hedge exactly. against the risk. Absolutely. So the hedging becomes uh, bringing forward some payments that you must make. They mm. can even uh, negotiate a discount for an early payment mm. and, then, and then try to pay for it. Mm. But eventually, you can only pay for something that has brought in. So eventually, um, we'll get a situation where people now don't even have the CDs because you must have the CDs to pay for it. Yeah. Then things now calm down. We've seen a situation where speculation took us to 13, 14, but we came back to 8. Because people now had dollars that they didn't need for, but they, have, they didn't need to pay. You need to pay your staff in cities. If you go and buy dollars and put it in your account and you can't pay your staff, what do you do? You have to sell it and mm -hmm. so on. So, um, yes, we've had situations, but there's a point to which people will now have to stop. So, mm -hmm. hopefully, this short period, you know, around this time is also when people pay dividends. Mm -hmm. And we've had a situation where the cocoa didn't do as well as it's always done. So, it means yeah. that we had a, a shortfall. There were some delays with some of the Arameans who were doing the IMF and World Bank. Thankfully, some of them have come through. So we've had some issues around that. But thankfully, my understanding is that all of this, it will come to an end when we have the next tranche of IMF money. All right, time to turn to the uh, financial markets. Interest rates tumbled once again, but marginally as demand for treasury bills eased. That's according to auction results by the Bank of Ghana. However, the government recorded a marginal oversubscription of treasury bills. Uh, Patrick Edemagama is head of trading at Republic Securities. He joins me on Zoom uh, with the latest. Uh, so what were the results from last Friday's trading, um, Patrick? Yes, Darrell, so um, the government raised a total of 3.2 billion accepting all uh, the bids and unlocking them against a target of 3.18 uh, billion. Again, this was slightly oversubscribed. We've seen that there was a dip in the rates. The 91 day cleared at 25.1%, dropping by 10 basis points. We saw the 182 day closing at 226.95%, dropping by five basis points. And then the 34 also dropped by five basis point to clear at 27.95 percent okay uh, so what does this result say about the sentiments on the market generally plus news that uh, possibly this week there could be a deal on external debt restructuring how could that impact the markets as well well what we are saying is that um, there is still a lot of demand for the treasury bill and that is showing the level of the confidence people are beginning to gather in the in the in the treasury bill but also there is also a sentiment that we are in election year so people are still watching carefully to see if anything will disrupt the market with this euro bond news coming in we expect 
that um, there will be more confidence in the market. However, uh, on the flip side, we know that uh, people, are, people are investing in the treasury bill because there are no options. Now we have the commercial paper market also coming up that will create options on the market. So we are studying to see how this will play out. On the stock market, um, SIC Insurance tipped to make some gains this week. What's happening there? Well, um, on the other side, we expect uh, SIC uh, to actually see some dip because of uh, the level of uh, demand. The demand on the market now is below the market price and the supply is also at the current market price of 25 pesos. So with this coming up, uh, I think if uh, the supply is able to go through because supply has been mounting for some time now, then we expect the market price to drop by at least a, a peso. So not exactly a gain, is it? Uh, well, no, but I mean, we can see how the, the demand and supply plays out uh, in, in this case. I want to ask you about um, Atlantic Lithium because uh, the lithium miner became uh, the first to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange um, last week. How are they faring in the market? Well, we've seen that there has been demand mounting up for Atlantic Lithium because they, they were introduced to the market and this is not an IPO where people will have the chance to buy in a lot of interest in the retail market for this particular uh, equity is mounting up. Uh, we've, we still see the price at the 4.4. The so mm. with time, we expect if this demand uh, actually mounts up, uh, and then we should expect the price to go up. And it's, it's, still in the, it's still in the early days for the company. People are also watching to see how they perform uh, in terms of their production, and that will affect the market price. What else are we looking at, out for this week? Well, we are still expect the demand for MTN to be picking up on the stock market. Mm. Um, we, we, are, we are seeing demand for MTN and GCB. We expect that demand to continue. Also, on the sell side, we expect Farm Milk, EGL, and uh, Societe to actually have uh, more offers on the market. And that can make them lose some, um, some prices on the market. All right, Patrick Edemagama, Head of Trade and Republic Securities, appreciate your time with us on the marketplace. Now, let's turn to other stories for you. Indigenous Bank, JCB, has hinted of the need to expand its operations beyond the shores of the country in the coming years. This was disclosed by its managing director, Kofi Adumako. The bank, which made a dramatic return from its loss-making position in 2022 to record profits in 2023, believes the expansion will enable uh, GCP to capitalize on opportunities that exist um, in the Africa continental free trade area. The bank held a Thanksgiving service to commemorate its 70th anniversary. And here's more. With 23 staff in 1953, GCB Bank was the first Ghanaian-owned bank. The 70th anniversary celebration of the bank coincided with a remarkable turnaround from a significant loss in 2022 due to the domestic debt exchange exercise to an impressive profit after tax of 944.1 million Ghana CDs. Total assets also experienced exponential growth from 21.3 billion in 2022 to 26. 6.9 billion in 2023. Additionally, total cash on hand increased by 25% to 5.6 billion, reaffirming the bank's position as one of the largest banks in terms of asset value in the country. Speaking at the Thanksgiving service to climax the 70th anniversary celebration of the bank, managing director of the bank, John Kofi Adumako, details what spurs the bank on. The resilience of the bank has seen us through. From a bank born in 1953, we come in time, to a bank today, 70 years later, it's clear what GCB has achieved. Uh, we've achieved quite a lot um, for our shareholders, uh, for our staff, and for our customers, more importantly. Uh, GCB Bank has been very successful from that perspective. We've carried all stakeholders along. We've shaped the business of doing banking in Ghana. Uh, we've invested heavily in indigenous Ghanaian businesses and in rural communities and, and, uh, and brought development to those communities. Mr. Adumako emphasized the need for the bank to expand its operations beyond Ghana's borders. Looking at the African market today, with the continental free trade area creating one market for a bank like GCB, 
it's time for us to go out of Ghana. He expressed optimism about the economy's rebound. I'm focused on the economy uh, and we know we are working with the IMF um, and so the program government is implementing a program. I'm confident that we will come out successful uh, as a country eventually. Delivering the sermon, Reverend Eastwood Anaba urged banks to focus on supporting the local economy. May God empower you to go into something I just give that term, sacrificial banking. I don't know what it means. It just jumped into my mind and I just thought I should say it. that a bank should think about and I know you do that. Some of the rural communities you, you adopt and you help. May the Lord empower you to do it and to do more. A Thanksgiving service attended by current and past managers and staff, board members, clients and shareholders featured prayers and blessings from members of the clergy. The event concluded with praise and appreciation for GCB Bank's achievements. <laughs> All right, you're watching the marketplace. So today has been a marked as International HR Day with a focus on how HR is shaping the new future with uh, sub-themes of championing ethical tech and AI integration, redefined future workplaces, excellence in people, uh, leadership, and continuous investment in skills and education. Emily Quist is Manager of People and Change Unit of KPMG. She joins me in the studio to talk about about it and uh, so i was just wondering people and change unit because i mean kpmg is an audit company tell us about the people and change unit yes definitely um so kpmg is a multidisciplinary firm meaning that we provide services across right uh, we have an advisory practice um and within that is the people and change unit which i'm representing today mm -hmm. so for us what we do is that we provide hr consultancy services to companies right so anything hr we wear it we um, try to help organizations navigate through transformational change, behavioral change management. But I'll break it down, you know, for people to really understand. So if you want to have the right people within your organizations, you know, in, in the right positions, reach out to us. We'll help you with recruitment. If you want to ensure, if you, maybe you're even doing, um, you're trying to acquire an organization, right, and you want to have HR due diligence, we're definitely your guys. So if, I mean, I would ask that our listeners go onto a KPMG web, Ghana website and look at the things that we do, right? We're just a phone call away from pushing your business to the next level. Okay, that's some marketing there. <laughs> but, but let's talk about uh, International, HR, uh, International HR Day, which is being marked today. Yes. Um, why, why is it important to, uh, to put a focus on um, HR? And uh, tell us a bit more about the theme for this year. Right, okay, so, um, so HR has, has actually transformed over the years and we've moved the needle from being just tactical HR to actually being very strategic. Mm -hmm. So right now we are muting our mics and we're speaking up. We're sitting at the table, we're demanding you know, a seat at the table and we're making, um, ensuring that we make strategic decisions right, with the CC execs. And so this day has been set aside to acknowledge the work, the hard work that HR professionals have put you know, into ensuring that our people at the forefront of this activity, strategic initiatives that are being put up. So it's good that we appreciate, you know, our people, and that's why we've set the day aside. I, I find the theme very interesting. It talks about uh, shaping um, uh, HR yes. uh, for the new future. It talks about, I see interesting themes like um, AI and tech and all of that. Tell us a bit more about the theme for this year and why the sub th uh, themes such as the uh, focus on AI and tech is very important in our day. I mean, we've, we've seen that's, that's the new way of working, right? We have artificial intelligence in basically everything that we're doing now. And it's, it's actually a good thing. That's, there's a good and the bad, right? And that's why we say ethical technology and ethical AI. Mm -hmm. So basically, I mean, with the, with, with the invention of artificial intelligence, it's going to help us streamline our activities and sort of free up space for HR professionals to be more strategic, right? And I mean, if you look at the themes, we also have, um, we want to have continuous learning. We want to invest in training so that in as much as, you know, this is here to stay, we want to be sure that we've equipped our people well enough to be able to handle, you know, the use of AI in the way we work in our processes. What would you say is the biggest challenge facing um, HR professionals in our uh, modern workplaces? 
Uh, well, because we're an HR firm, we, we work with lots of organizations, and I think one of the things that we've picked up would be data. Um, HR, right now, we're being more data-centric, because that's how we make decisions. So as opposed to being um, reactive, we are predictive, telling you that if you make a decision based off this, based on the data that we have, this would be the ripple effect tomorrow, right? But then a challenge would be actually having the data at hand, like a benchmark data. So people want to have the data to, you know, to make informed decisions, but is it, even if it is there, how sure are we that it is, it is true, you know, to its form? Yeah, and while we talk about data, how, how do you think um, technology can be helpful or shape HR going forward? Um, like I said, it's it's going to help us streamline operations. It's it's been there, you know, um, with it, with HR. We want to, you know, have. I mean, I would push that that HR professionals um, ensure that they are always upskilling. You know, they are always training themselves. Um, talk of collaboration with uh, with IT um, departments in different organizations, so mm -hmm. that we can integrate artificial intelligence into our technology systems. You know in our field. All right. And so it's a week-long event. Yes. Um, KPMG has started marking it. I mean, what are you doing to mark HRD? Okay, so um, we, we have this thing where we call, uh, we're trying to appreciate our HR, right? So if you go onto our KPMG Ghana LinkedIn page, um, you would see flyers on there that, that say what we are doing, you know. It's basically just going on there, appreciating the HR uh, professionals who have had an, an impact in your organization or even had an impact in your personal life, right? And leaving a little note, you know, of love on there, telling them we appreciate them, we see them, and, you know, we are thankful to them. And also on Friday, we'll be having um, a virtual webinar session um, with seasoned speakers who will be talking about the S in ESG, um, talking about the way HR is shaping the future. And it's going to be very engaging. So I would ask that our listeners go on to our LinkedIn page, our Ghana LinkedIn page, and just check out the flyers and see how we can all contribute and be a part of this. Uh, while organizations are listening um, and they are watching as well, what, what can they improve, uh, what can they do to improve um, HR management in the organization? Right now, you have to be able to speak data. Speak, speak the language that your CSU understand. There's a understand. lot of emphasis on data. Yes, because we, everything we do right now is data driven. You know, if you're going to make decisions, how do you support those decisions that you're making? So I would, I would say that, you know, in terms of... By the of, way, what sort of data are you looking at? Um, data on, on our people, you know, HR matrix you can use, you know, to support um, whatever initiative you're trying to, um, you know, implement within your organization. So definitely upskilling. You, we should try to upskill ourselves regularly. Do not put yourself in a box, you know, do not be confined. Um, I would say that, like I, I mentioned already, try to collaborate with your IT function so that you can, you know, co you can integrate um, AI into your, your processes. Okay. And, and how can organizations get involved in KPMG's um, HR Day celebration? Like I said, just go onto our uh, KPMG Ghana LinkedIn page and you'll see, you know, the flyers and, and what we are doing. But really appreciating our HR um, professionals is not just a KPMG thing. You can, you can go on there from other organizations and appreciate the people you have worked with, you know, outside of KPMG. Mm -hmm. And um, as we conclude, tell us, um, or what, what sort of advice would you give to um, young people aspiring to be HR professionals right now? What should they be on the lookout for? I've mentioned data quite a lot of time. We, <laughs> um, we need to have that mindset to understand data. So you need to um, be open to learning, right? But more than that, I would say that they should improve their soft skills because you know, being an HR professional, that's something that you have to you know, hone. Okay, you need to harness your, your, your empathetic skills, your decision making. You know, not, it's, it's really not a one size fits all for us. You know, there are really exceptions to the rule. So how do you make decisions? How, how are your problem solving skills? All of this have to be harnessed, right? And so I would say that look for mentors in the, in the profession that you can work with. Even, even, you know, before you become an HR professional and just embrace the change. All right, Emily Quest, uh, Manager of People and Change Unit KPMG, appreciate your time with us um, as we mark International HR Day. Um, it's a week long for KPMG. What's the highlight once again of your celebration? 
appreciating your HR professionals, go on to our KPMG LinkedIn page and appreciate as much as you can. Thank you, Evelyn Quist. Uh, I don't know if we have money lap, but we're going to wrap up. But if there is, we are going to play that right after I do so. So check out our website, myjoinline.com for a slash uh, business for the day's latest stories, including our policymakers have consistently failed uh, to take measures to buttress CD. That's according to the IA. You can check it out on our website, myjoyonline.com. Uh, we'll leave you with today's episode of Money Lab. Hello, welcome to Money Lab. My name is Ransford Matekole, Head of New Business Advisory at Enterprise Trustees. On our last episode, we discussed into detail the three-tier pension scheme in Ghana. Today, we will be discussing how to take advantage of this three-tier pension scheme in order to save adequately for retirement. Under National Pensions Act 2008, Act 766, workers in Ghana can now contribute up to 35% of their basic salary to their pensions and not pay income tax on those contributions. This gives the workers a great opportunity to save for their retirement. To fully take advantage of this three-tier pension scheme, ensure your employer is paying the mandatory tier 1 and tier 2 contributions, encourage your employer to set up a provident fund for all your staff under the tier 3, and make a personal commitment to your future by signing up to the personal pension scheme. Until we come your way again on our next episode of Money Lab, please remember to plan well.